Right. You need comedy when life is too serious. That's yeah. exactly when you need it. You need it when life is so unbearable that someone has to crack a joke to keep you from crying. Hello, and welcome to the Pop Culture Contrarian Podcast with Thomas and Sterling. Hello. We have stuffed and buried Andrew out in the woodshed, so uh, you won't be seeing him anymore. At least till next week. At least till next week. His zombie will, will be joining us. Uh, all right, Thomas, so you want to introduce our topic for, for today? The last gasps of late night comedy. The last gasps of late yeah. night comedy. All right, so... This is all surrounding one particular thing that's just launched. Right? Yeah, recently, and I think it's only three episodes long that so is far. Right. Yep. Uh, it's called the Strike, Strike Force, Force five. five, and these five are um, relatively well-known um, late-night comedians. So you have Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Seth Meyers, John Oliver, and Stephen Colbert. They have kind of come together in their attic basement shed spaces supposedly mm-hmm. yeah uh, supposedly. set up a camera set up a mic and then they kind of uh, i don't know facetime each each other into these episodes where i guess they kind of joke with each other without writers writing for them so right and joke is a bold term it calling is. them comedians I, I'm going to have to make an editor's note. That's just a lie. They're not comedians. <laughs> no, I don't. Maybe they used to be. Yeah, they, I'm sure that they, at one point, had some stand-up they were doing and other things. I know that um, Jimmy Fallon and, I think, uh, Seth Meyers were both on Saturday Night Live. Yep. Yep. So. I mean, at one point, I would watch Colbert just for entertainment. Even Colbert, though he was always hating yeah. on the right, I found him funny because he was actually making jokes. Yeah, and they just kind of stopped the making jokes part. Well, I think I, I think we've kind of noticed this in uh, prior episodes, but the left just it doesn't, or the le- woke left, put it that way. Yeah, the post Donald Trump left. Right, they've lost all sense of humor. They take themselves so seriously they can't joke about anything. Yeah, I remember a, a interview with a comedian a couple years ago where he said, "Oh, I think I think." life today is too serious to be a comedian. So that's why I stopped touring and stuff. I mean, if that's what you think, then you need comedy. Right. You need comedy when life is too serious. That's exactly when you need it. You need it when life is so unbearable that someone has to crack a joke to keep you from crying. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And these people are like, Oh no, it's too serious. We can't even make jokes about it. It's like, you're missing the whole point. Yeah. Um, What is it? What's that saying about if you can't laugh at yourself? Well, if you can't laugh at yourself, you don't have a sense of humor, and that's for sure. For sure, and and you're taking yourself too seriously, and you're thinking you're too right. highly of yourself. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, they launched this podcast, and it's – we we should point out, we haven't actually watched or listened to their podcast because we haven't watched or listened to any of their shows for the past few years because we're not masochists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think their shows are dying. They're yeah. absolutely dying. And th- this this writer strike which uh, has been going on now for over 3 months, I think. Uh it's been a while, at least a few months, yeah. All right. So, what are the what are these guys going to do with themselves? I mean, they don't have to do anything. They're they're worth millions upon millions. Right. They're not hurting. But um I guess they have decided they were they're they're going to do something. Uh, I'm I'm curious, and having not watched an episode, I'm wondering if they have any of those kind of political grindstones that are going to go on. Oh, I'm I'm yeah. yeah, I'm certain they have to because some, for some of them, like Stephen Colbert and Jimmy Kimmel, it seems like and John Oliver, political grindstones are the only things they talk about. Right, or at least that's the only thing I've seen from them for the past five years. Well, even Colbert, when he was funny. And he was mocking, mockingly being a conservative. His whole stick was com- was politics. Right. He was always in politics. Right. That's true. Um, I didn't appreciate how much he believed himself, though. Yeah. Uh, I I first noticed him during the whole Occupy Wall Street thing mm-hmm. where he interviewed a couple of, uh, not their leaders, because Occupy Wall, Pre- Wall Street didn't have leaders. Occupiers. Huh? But their spokespeople, anyhow. And he, he did the whole bit about the, so you want to Occupy Wall Street and and send the wavy AV through the up and down, you know, doing a whole bunch of crazy symbols and hand gestures and just like 
what you're talking about is gobbledygook. Is it was his point? You don't mm-hmm. have a point. You got to have a point to a right. protest. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I was living in D.C. when uh, occupiers came in. Uh, we're occupying Wall Street, but they also occupied um, Washington. Uh, a, a few blocks of Washington, D.C. Maybe we should do that again, although I'm sure we'd all end up with multi-decade prison sentences if we tried that in Washington, D.C. today. You have to have a, a, a certain political bent. Yeah. You have to have a certain skin tone, and you also have to set the right amount of fires, which is more than zero. Well, yeah. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> we're watching the death of the late night show you know right right now it's especially accelerating because of this writer's strike and they're just desperately trying to do something so that they're not off the air and it's just not landing because these people are not interesting you know stephen colbert is so separated from the reality of everyday life now that he has that bit that's gone viral a few times of him saying you know yeah gas prices are going to go up because of the war in ukraine but you know i'm okay paying more for gas because i drive a tesla (laughs) like great we don't have $60,000 to pay for a brand new car, yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Well, I I think we're, you know, so we're talking about how we're seeing the death spasms of the kind of this late night comedy hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and the golden era of it, you could say, was maybe Ed Sullivan and then Johnny Carson. Yeah, I think the golden era, you'd have to say, was Johnny Carson, probably. Ed, Ed Sullivan, like, started it. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's just my perception Your of perception, it. Your perception, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, back in the day, Ed Sullivan was huge. And that's where the Beatles made their debut in America. Mm-hmm. Like, it was a big show. It was a big deal. And I think there was value to that. It yeah. gave, you know, one thing Exposure everyone... Exposure to, to artists and others that people might not have otherwise really known who they were. Right. I mean, just imagine the world if we hadn't had the Beatles... I'm saying that sort of sarcastically. They are one of the greatest of all time. But I think, and this is something a lot of people have commented on, back in that day, in the Ed Sullivan day, you had cultural touchstones that you and your neighbor and the guy you run into the grocery store and the person you run into at work have all experienced together, watching the Ed Sullivan show uh, or watching the Johnny Carson show or repeating the same jokes or whatever it was. There was a sense of broad community connections. Right, through the TV even. Right. Uh, And now they're just definitely not that one because they've expanded it too far. Mm -hmm. You don't need five uh, late night shows and there's actually way more than five. These are just the five biggest. Uh, And also, you know, you have to not thumb your nose at half the country. (laughs) Right. Um, How many people watch, I mean, what are the demographics and then how many people are watching network TV late night anymore? Uh, Well, we don't have those numbers pulled up, but I mean, it's got to be boomers right it's got to be older people are the ones who still watch tv because speaking as a millennial anytime a commercial comes on and i'm not able to skip it i i pull more and more of my hair out and if i watch too much network television i will be bald when was the i mean when was the last time you watched network tv um i mean actually on a television where i navigated via a channel yeah what were you watching too i think I guess I'd have to say last year watching college football. Okay. I did recently so watch sports, basically. I, I did effectively watch network television last Saturday for the first college football games, okay. but I was watching on YouTube, so that doesn't quite count. No, I wouldn't count that. I'm, but I did still have to sit through the commercials, which was maddening. So YouTube streams some of those games, right? Uh, officially, this was only sp- the game I watched, which was the Georgia uh, UT Martin game, was only supposed to be streaming on ESPN Plus. But there was someone who was streaming it from their home, I think, without. Oh, uh, so you're watching a pirated version. I guess. So, but you weren't. You could have turned on your TV and watched it on network TV. I'm no, not sure. Saying, I'm not sure. Uh, it said ESPN. I looked it up where to watch it. It said ESPN Plus. It didn't say anything else. I, I think the only time in the last, I'm going to say, almost decade that I've actually sat down and watched network TV probably was a sporting event. Right, I, I, I watch the Super Bowl think. pretty much every year. Yeah, Super uh, Bowl have for most of my life, you know, and that for a while was like the only sports game I would watch. But it was also, it's also the only television program I watch because yeah. if I want to watch a movie, I'll watch it without commercial breaks and without all the editing. Well, yeah, like the whole streaming has changed how so many so many of us consume media now. Right. I think that 
it is an interest. I do think that the number of people watching network TV is dropped and is continuing to and drop. And we have the number on that, at least, right. sort of. Uh, so yeah. I think it said Jimmy Fallon, right? It was Fallon, not Kimmel. Yeah, Fallon had, what, 11 million uh, regular viewers. When he was starting out when he was in starting. 2013, 2014. Yeah. And now he's down to a couple of million, it said. Yeah. So that's 9 million people who are no longer watching right. because there's better options. So is it dying because the comedy is so bad? Or is it dying because it's an old um, uh, media format that is just not the the n- new generations just aren't aren't uh, interested interested in or u- using really? It, I don't think it's an either or. I think the comedy was allowed to deteriorate as far as it did to the point where they're just preaching at you like they did all during COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, saying wear your masks and if you're well, if I you're think, trying yeah. to use this horse drug, then I I hope you die. You know. It's just like, okay, you're actively alienating half the audience. So I think that was allowed to happen because it was already a medium that was on its way out. Okay. So they're, they're kind of like their last gasp was just to be propagandist for the work. Right. You said a, a telling point earlier, I think, which was that at least for Fallon and Kimmel and uh, Stephen Colbert, they're on network television. Mm-hmm. So they have different rules than cable or HBO like John right. Oliver. Yeah. And so they... What was the line you said? They had the obligation to be creative. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They they were forced to be more creative because they couldn't be crass. Right. Like John Oliver can right. be crass. And so that's the only joke I've seen so far from this podcast is him saying the F-bomb, which is like, oh, he, 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 he. Right. I guess. Yeah. Um, but there was no joke there. Anyhow. Uh, so, yeah, these guys on network television had to be creative and actually come up with funny things to say that didn't rely on breaking a taboo. Right. Uh, and seemingly, I, I want to say since COVID, maybe even before that, they just kind of gave up on that. And they're like, screw that. What does the elites want me to say? What do the elites want me to say? And I'll just say that. And then they'll like me. And that's the important thing here. Well, you did make a, a kind of a point where you're saying since COVID. And I'm wondering if the execs or whoever saw the the, the numbers were already already sinking on well you would think covid would have helped them you would think i know it would be you would think a not necessarily captive audience but more people at home maybe maybe we can really sell it to them but yeah it it's gone the other direction and i think maybe the calculation was hey let's let's go let's really go full propaganda here and you know we can really try to control culture yeah and a point that that I think, I think you kind of raised it um, when we were talking about this at a time. Does comedy, does comedy make culture or mm. does comedy reflect culture or as kind of one of the, one of the ways we would put it is comedians, are they like barometers of culture? Right, right. So, yeah, you know, is it that they're reflecting something that's already existing mm-hmm. and then they get fame because they're saying what everyone's thinking? I think that's true of some comedians for certain. Mm-hmm. I think with some comedians, though, I think there's an argument to be made that they have shaped culture, and it's the top tier comedians who are capable of this. It's mm-hmm. not your everyday comedian; they're they're just commentating, observational humor, whatever. But I think uh, comedy groups like Monty Python have had a profound impact on the culture themselves, and I think maybe the sense of humor, the uh, style of jokes that Monty Python engaged in was already out there in the culture, but there was nowhere for it to coalesce until they came in and said, this is our brand. And then everyone who liked that was like, oh yeah, we're big fans. So I guess in the sense of them moving culture is the comedian will look for something and mock it Mm. before anybody else. Right. And there's super good examples of that with Monty Python. Yes. Like uh, the, the one from the life of Brian. Uh, about the the womb. The guy who says he wants to become a woman. Right. And then John Cleese's character is just like, but you can't be a mother. You haven't got a womb. Yeah. Which, wow, in crazy world we're living in now, that's not even a joke. No, it's not. Yeah. But the, the great line in that bit is, well, he's allowed to have the right to have a child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he can't yeah. have a child, but he can have the right to have a child. Right, right. <laughs> So, yeah, I think I wonder if they took themselves so seriously that they thought 
what we'll do with our audience is we're going to shape the behavior of Americans by telling them all this COVID behavior propaganda, like go right. get go get your shot, your vaccines, go wear your mask or social distance, all these things that were just straight out of, you know, what, what the um, administration was wanting. Well, it, whatever double speak was coming out from the right. administration or the CDC at that time. And then it would change with the next week and they would change too and they would pretend they had never changed. And it just, it, it's infuriating. I mean, I do remember the clip from Colbert when he had um, uh, John Stewart on. And oh, yeah. when John Stewart kind of surprised Colbert, I think, by going off script and and saying, hey, this came effectively, this was a lab leak, not not just from... Right. It was a very. It market. was maybe the funniest thing yeah. they've had on one of their shows in several years because Colbert see says something like, "Well, if there, if it came from a lab, and then John Oliver's, you know, if yeah, yeah, he's like, like if <laughs> if the novel Wuhan coronavirus <laughs> came from a lab, well, let's ask it around. Did it come from the wet market? Did it come from the novel Wuhan coronavirus lab right there? <laughs> it's the same name for the disease and the lab. And yeah, it's like, oh, that's a pretty good point. Well, I, I think it was pretty telling Colbert's kind of expression and reaction and trying to, like, backpedal away from it and, like, trying to, like, we can't, we can't. This is, you know, quote, conspiracy theory zone. We need to stay away. Right. He was still doing that, but I think even the fact that John was willing to say it kind you of meant John they Stewart. were. Uh, John Stewart. Yeah. I, I said Oliver earlier, too. John Stewart both times. Um, I think the fact that he was willing to say it was indicative of the fact that they're easing the restrictions on that they wouldn't have let him even uh, say that not back when he did it though it was he was pretty early on that he, he was, was pretty early he on. was pretty early well on. rather he was early on in terms of the administration admitting it may have come from a lab he was no. not early on in terms no, he, of people speculating it came from a lab no yes the, the administration still hadn't come close to admitting it but yes there well early on there were people trying to say hey this doesn't look like it's um, just na of natural origin. This right. there seems to be markers here. There seems to be, you know, at least something that we should seriously consider. Right, but Fauci realized that he would get blamed because he is at fault if that's the case. So well, he had to suppress that. potentially. I think that they thought less try to steer culture in regard to this yeah. issue. Um, and then after that issue had kind of passed, they were like, "Well, I enjoyed steering culture." You know, well, I like thinking of myself as the person who well, tells people what to do. Maybe, but the thing is they threw half the, over half the country under the bus the whole time. Yeah, and, and said, we hope you die, basically. Well, Kimmel effectively did say that yeah. in his joke. Like, yeah. well, if we if you go to the hospital and you're suffering from some kind of um, serious issue and one person's vaccinated and the other's not, well, he basically tells the unvaccinated person, tough rocks. Right, yeah. So... You know, that's a complete lack of empathy for, like, yeah. 70 million people. Right. You know? So, um, I mean, they showed their true colors in that. Um, I think that the gamble was, I don't know if they felt like, I, I, I do think there was just there was just a, a hubris th to their own significance. Yeah, and I think it was that there was so few dissenting voices at the time that it was yeah. just, we can get away with it because right. no one's going to call us out on it. And so now you have... These five guys doing this kind of. You'd expect it to be funny because they're funny guys. Yeah. allegedly. I mean, it's it's kind of a lame podcast. Right. Um, and it's strange to me that they're going into, interestingly enough, territory that is more territory that is native to, you know, millennials and, and yeah. Zoomers. They're the ones that are consuming media via podcasts, via YouTube. This is their native land. And so here are these old fogies, these dudes come in that I'm sure everyone's heard of them, yeah. but are they are they really going to be impressed by the product that they've, yeah. they've, they've been producing? I will say John Oliver at least has a place in my heart because he is part of one of my favorite TV shows, Community, and he's a good part of that show. So. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate him for that. And so I, I suspect there's a lot of people like me. I think Community had a pretty young audience. So they probably know John Oliver at least. Yeah. I guess what I'm wondering is with all the stuff out there and all the people that become, I mean, literally YouTube stars. Right. That nobody, like, 
J.P. Sears. J.P. Sears is funny, mm. legit. He puts his sketches together. He he his and he's not afraid of any topic. He's not afraid of topics. There's a guy who's just um is really knocking it out of the park right. when it comes and, to it. Uh, Mr. Beast, the biggest streamer of all time, I think, just crossed a billion followers on one of his platforms. Really? Which is good night. So uh, these guys aren't funny. I think almost everyone would agree with that at this point. I think what, they used to be, but they're not right now. Agreed. I think they used to be funny. John Oliver, Stephen Colbert, I don't know about Kimmel or Fallon, but Colbert and Oliver at least used to be funny, and Myers. Um, what What is funny? What do, What does Thomas find funny? Um, I'm kind of, I like the situational dry humor. Okay, okay. Uh, I do like observational humor. Like, I really enjoyed, for example, the Sein- Seinfeld. Okay, so um, what's the deal with airline food? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that observational humor where um, it, it, that leans into the uh, the hyperbolic. That mm-hmm. is funny uh, in, in a lot of ways to me because, yeah, life is, there are funny, there's a lot of funny things about just living. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, and so just and and I think one of the reasons I like it is it didn't take itself seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you Seinfeld never thought you, he was anything special. No, and you you watch jokes. Seinfeld and you're not getting preached at. No, <laughs> no, <none laughs> it was deliberately a show about nothing, nothing yes. to preach. Um, which, in a lot of ways, I kind of appreciate it. I, yeah. I, and I, and that the woke left who've taken over much of the media mm-hmm. they've forgotten that or they, they well and they it maybe they can't even accept these old funny things seinfeld uh i've i've definitely heard people on the left talking about how problematic it is now i one of my really? good buddies in my old woke friend group uh used to love the tv show scrubs with uh oh yeah that was a funny one I donald face on it and then you know as he got more woke he was like oh i don't know if i can watch that show anymore it's so problematic because it does things like use the term gay as an insult, which was extremely common in oh, the year that's 2003. Gay. That is so gay. <laughs> yeah. I guess the rule is anything that could potentially be offensive to a special group is off limits. Right. And a special group is anyone who's not white and male and straight. Pr- pretty much. Yeah. So you like observational humor. You said you like dry humor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think earlier you were saying British humor, and a lot of British humor can be like self deprecating. Is that right. something you like? Yeah, they're making fun of themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think of there's Monty Python. Mm-hmm. There's also uh, Faulty Towers. Yeah, those are kind of classic humor. Uh, I'm there's a little slapstick in there, mm-hmm. but um, it's more kind of situational and witty. Yeah, I'm I, I slapstick. I'm a, I think I'm there with you. I like a little bit of it. I like mm-hmm. it as a, like a seasoning. Yeah, but it's not. I don't go. For you know the the Three Stooges, I can watch a few minutes of that, but then I'm done. Um, I like witty humor uh, where it's very quick and mm. you know just rapid fire. That's a lot of fun. I like uh, the TV show community. I mentioned it earlier. Right. It does a lot of these high concept humor things where it you know sometimes spends an entire episode setting up a joke, and so it's like you have to buy into all this stuff, and then you get to the joke, and it's just bust out laughing laughing at the end. Mm-hmm. So that kind of thing, or I love a funny monologue. Uh, I think a great example of that is uh, like the Princess Bride. There's there's two. There's uh, Vincini against uh, the Man in Black, and he's like, "Never going against the Sicilian when death is on the line." And just mm-hmm. you know the way he's saying it is just part of why it's funny. But then also uh, towards the end of the movie, at the marriage ceremony, you know the famous the famous bit there. Yeah, Mowage. Yeah. Mowage is what brings us together today. Yeah, that that's yeah. just hilarious, objectively. Right. Um, so that's what I find funny. So where do you find humor today? Where do you find comedy today? Where do you go looking for it? Uh, I probably see most of it on YouTube. Okay, um, YouTube. A lot of... So is it comedian, like people who are YouTube stars, or is it uh, stand-up comics releasing bits on, on video? A little bit of both, but probably more stand-up. I do think that maybe there's been a resurgence of stand-up comedians because of you know social media i don't know if resurgence is the right term but it's strong right now that's for certain yeah uh, but you you know you had pretty great stand-up in the 2010s with uh louis ck and uh jim gaffigan 
and right. they're still around. And uh, Bill Burr, Bill Burr's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and then before that, you know, Robin Williams was alive, and he did right. stand up, and he was great. Uh, but I'm wondering if there was there's more of an, a possibility. It's kind of maybe it's kind of just like music. There's more of a possibility for some unknown to rise rapidly. Yeah, that seems of, true. Because of the social media w- landscape. There's well, I mean, maybe there's a a greater desire for comedy because pe- because it's it's an escape from the drudgery of the situation we feel like we're in as a country. We're very mm-hmm. divided economically speaking. We're a lot of us are struggling. Yeah, and you want something to kind of like a, a release, as it were, from the and the pressure, but something that also re- you can relate to. Yeah. And I think maybe part of the problem with the woke right now is if they ad- do attempt comedy, it's not, it's preachy, it's not relatable. It's not like, yeah, it doesn't, it's not something you can be like, yes, that person, they get it. And I, c- you know, it's, it's almost like it's comes across as condescending, yeah. judgmental. Um, it's, it, it's it, just so not. much of it is the kind of the same jokes they've been telling for years and years too. Where I'm noticing, I, I do see a lot of stand up on YouTube or TikTok. I know, I know, you can you can shame me for it, but it's a very you're, you're brainwashed by the Chinese now. You know uh, this. Yes, I am. Uh, all hail Xi. He does not look at all like Winnie the Pooh. Is your accent beginning to change a little bit too? Oh yes, I speak Chinese. <laughs> no, that would get me so canceled. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> know. <laughs> um. Anyhow, what I notice is a lot of these stand-up comedians, you know, the ones who I don't like as much for the reason I'm about to expound, will make fun of Republicans for the same thing that's been said for years and years and years. Or Mm. they'll mention Republicans, but it's like, um, this was actually a pretty good joke I just saw from a young comedian, which was, uh, you know, you young men, when you're looking for a wife, you you might want to marry a Republican woman because she'll actually want to be around the kids. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is a pretty good joke. It's a pretty good joke. Yeah. But it's, you know, they'll make fun of Republicans or they'll talk about the good things about Republicans. Like I want someone who's fiscally responsible. Well, that's, let's not, let's be honest. That's not even really a Republican position anymore. Mm. It should be, but it's not. So they're just, even when they try to throw a bone to the entire half of the country who doesn't agree with them, it's still out of touch usually, which is just, I don't know. Frustrating. So, all right, I, I, I will point out, since we've spent this whole episode making fun of the Strike Force 5, that at least Jimmy Fallon, who I find completely impossible to distinguish from Jimmy Kimmel usually, I did special <laughs> preparation to get it right here, Jimmy Fallon at least does these kind of challenges, these games on his show that are kind of fun. Mm-hmm. So, like, he'll do the, I think it's called Lie to Me or something, where his team puts something absurd in a box and he has a celebrity look in the box and then either try to describe what it actually is or lie to him about what it is. And then he has to guess you're telling the truth or you're lying. That's, you know, at least it's entertainment yeah. and it's not being preached at. Yeah. I th- I mean, I think Fallon and Kimmel couldn't be any different, honestly. Uh, maybe you're right. But I just, for me, I don't know if it's face blindness or just the fact that they have the same first name. To me, they're completely indistinguishable. I think Fallon was... It's more of a genuinely kind of fun, nice guy to hang around. Uh, mm-hmm. I think Jimmy is insufferable. I, I, I Jimmy, Jimmy, which Jimmy Kimmel is insufferable. Okay, Jimmy Kimmel is insufferable. Yeah, he just it's not a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, while I'm trying to say a couple nice things about these people, I'll also throw out that I, I like I said, I used to like Stephen Colbert, mm-hmm. uh, and I already said one nice thing about John Oliver, but with Colbert. You know, I relate to him on the fact that he is a massive Lord of the Rings nerd, and I also am a massive Lord of the Rings nerd. And to his credit, I've never yet seen him be stumped on a Lord of the Rings question. He's been asked some tough ones, and he always nails them. Uh, so as a Lord of the Rings nerd, i got to give him props for that. It's very impressive. You're just good for you. You're trying to find common ground. Yeah, and that's, yeah. I'm that's trying good. to say these people aren't evil. They're just not funny. They're just ill-informed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I think if they were freed from a kind of, I don't know. I mean, if they were freed from the woke mind drivers, yeah, they could maybe get their comedy back. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, well, that's what we hope for. Really, the whole nation, right? Is we just need y'all to get over this woke mind virus, 
everything is not about power. Everything is not about race. You aren't your ancestors, and neither am I. Just come on, live in the world today, please. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of today and maybe what we hope for in the future, what what do we think there's anything salvageable about the late night show? Is there anything we'd hate to see fade into the past? Yeah, I mean, I th this this isn't just limited to late night, but there's as our society kind of has divided, it also has kind of atomized mm -hmm. to some degree uh, and continues to do so maybe even more. Yeah. And so the collective enjoyment and collective kind of cultural experience that used to happen with like late night, the Ed Sullivan show or right. Johnny Carson, that I think had value. It, yeah, I agree. And we would, we would learn about new comedians or new musicians or new actors or, or new learn more about these different ones that we already knew um, in these interviews that they would have. Um, that, is kind of is increasingly being lost. Yeah. And part of it is I am a person who likes tradition mm -hmm. and there is kind of a proud tradition of the late yeah. night show from, as you said, Ed Sullivan, right. Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, David Letterman, who I, I never found David Letterman at all entertaining, but Jay Leno I thought was great. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we haven't mentioned him. Conan O'Brien. I love Conan. I think he's a very funny person. Uh, I thought his show was pretty good too. Uh, so I'd hate for, late night comedy shows to die with such a lame whimper from these guys. Cause mm. these are not nearly the best that late night comedy has to offer or has offered in the past. Well, I, yeah, you're right. Is it, is it just inevitable though? I mean, the way it, as the change already happened in a sense long ago enough that there's no getting it back. I mean, well, I, yeah, I think some of it, we're not going to get back. I think it's possible I think it's necessary for America to find a way to have cultural touchstones that everyone engages in mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how to do that, but it's something we have to do. Uh, but I think you could. Well, so many of those cultural touchstones are being, the, part of the problem is so many of those, those older cultural touchstones are actively being attacked. Right. And so it's not just as media or the way we in, intake media has shifted. But there's also an aggressive kind of um, movement against so many of the old one, the old kind of like un unifying um, cultural experiences. Cultural experiences that that are now, you know, you'll get shamed sometimes if you bring it up. Oh, right. you you liked that? Oh, you racist! Right. Obviously, going all the way back to the beginning of our country, they're trying to cancel, you know, Thomas Jefferson for owning right. slaves and stuff. Right. And it's like. If George Washington is a bad person because he owned slaves, there's never been a good person ever because George mm -hmm. Washington was a truly, truly remarkable man. Mm -hmm. um, but more recently, and this one actually is valid, with the, the cancellation of all of Bill Cosby's old work. Now, mm -hmm. granted, he actually yeah. was a horrendous monster who, who did horrible, horrible things to women. But that doesn't mean the Cosby show is a bad show. It doesn't yeah. mean all that value that was in that show and all that all the laughs you had from that show are undone. Mm -hmm. So what I hate is that so much of modern culture says if the artist can't be allowed, neither can their art. And it's like, no, it's one of the things artists do is they have something horrible in their brain frequently. And then they make beautiful art that everyone can experience because of their unique set of problems and gifts. Yeah, well, and their art isn't the totality of who they are as an individual. Right. Um, there is an element in which, of course, there's a motivation for the artist in creating the art, and there was a, a rationale for what they were creating. So, yes, when we're looking at art, there's an element of what of what we're trying to understand what the artist is, is trying to say. Right. But there's also an individual experience of the art. Like, right. The Once the art is made, right. yes, it does still belong to the artist, but it also belongs to the to the art enjoyer. Right. Well, it music, maybe music is the best for this, but there are certain music, because it can, especially when you were in your formative years, growing up and listening to, you know, uh, your favorite bands or favorite right. musicians, 
most of the time you were probably listening to them not at a concert where they were singing live, but on the radio or on a CD or MP3 player or YouTube or something. Right. But oftentimes, at least a lot of us, were, were listening to them while we were engaged in some activity like driving across the country or working um Right, or you were enjoying it with a friend or and doing something at friends. the same time. And there's an element of just experiencing that song, that music, that are tied to a moment in time where you were doing something. That's unique to you. That's unique. And so to try to, you know, when they go in and attack a song like um, Baby is Cold Outside. Let's right. take that one, for example, which many love because of the connection to Christmas and their own experiences and it's up. just it musically it is a beautiful song. It's a right. well, well arranged right. song. Right. Um and then, you know, now all these you know, when it I don't know the accusations of it being a rape song. Right, right. Yeah. Made it so these corporations that were scared to do anything that would offend, you know, were yeah. pulling it off the airways and stuff. And it's 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 sad because that's not what the vast majority of people who ever listened to that song before the accusations were made would have ever thought. And it's not what the song was about. No. Just factually, that's right. a wrong interpretation. Right. So I think that the, that element of individual experiences in regards to a broader cultural experience of an, a piece of art um, is less frequent now in our current culture. I mean... I think the most recent phenomenon like that was Oliver Anthony's um, uh, Richmond, North Richmond, of Richmond, North of Richmond. Yeah. That was kind of this sudden big flash phenomenon, and there's probably been a, a, a couple others, but it's it's becoming less and less um, possible for a possible. piece of art to kind of reach everyone at once. Well, and it, for it not to be completely denigrated by one side. Yeah. Right. Well, that's the point. That's the point. If if the left likes likes it, the right has to hate it. If the right likes it, the left has to hate it. And yeah. that's just not. <laughs> that's not a, a a path that leads anywhere. That's well, a path that leads into a brick wall. You have right, to and figure I, out something else. Then the great thing about the comedian was the comedian comes and he mocks what is worthy of being mocked. Right. Right. And. And deservedly so. And and both sides are worthy of being mocked. But sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, and it's it helps, like I said, don't take yourself too seriously. All right, so what have we talked about today, Thomas? We've talked about this Strike Force right. 5 podcast, or yeah, lame and, cast. And the apparent last gas of late night comedy on especially networks. I mean, like I think there's multiple factors because of that that are contributing to this. And maybe it is true that the biggest factor is the way people are consuming just, media has just changed. Yeah. I think that I think that must be the biggest factor, yeah. but I think the other factors of the lack of quality are very much relevant. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about that. We talked about how media is changing, how we consume culture, what we do find funny. Um, and we even tried to throw in a few good things about these people on Strike Force 5 because they're not terrible people. They're just not funny. And they, they, if they would stop taking themselves so seriously. Yeah. Or, yeah. or, Maybe not even themselves. Their positions politically. Yeah. Take, just... just, just Leave your you know. politics out of it, you know? Yeah. Try to be what, what uh, you know, Johnny Carson, who was definitely a man on the left, but was a man who... He had a massive audience of people who were on the right. right. Oh, yeah. He he tried to shoot right down the middle. Right. So, and then, and then we kind of broke down how COVID has affected, played into this as well. Yeah. So COVID is coming again, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's what they say. They're Part saying it's coming. Two, two, I actually know someone who thinks he just had it last week. So I guess it really is coming back, but it's, it's endemic. That's what we've been saying. Endemic yeah. means it's not going away. Well, it's going to be like the flu. Yeah. There's going to be friends that get the flu and you're like, oh, bummer. Stay away from me. Right. Stay away from me. I don't want to get it, but also yeah. I don't have to change the way I live my life because of this. No. Alrighty. Well, this has been the episode on the last gasps of late night comedy with Thomas and Sterling because we killed and murdered and buried Andrew no, as we, we said didn't. at the beginning. No, he he's lying. He's covering for us. Mm -hmm. He's giving us an alibi. All right. The Pop Culture Contrarian podcast is brought to you by The Patriot Post, which is the oldest online news digest of its kind in the world. Uh, it's right, it's free, 
Be sure to like and subscribe. Bye.